All right, A-Push Scholars, Mr. Beamer here. Let's finish up Chapter 15, talk about the national economy that was formed in America during the antebellum America period, 1790 to 1860. Here are some of the key concepts we're going to talk about today. The key word here is probably the revolutions. We had the Industrial Revolution, Agricultural, and also the Transportation Revolution. Hey, I forgot to uh, to uh, credit the song. That was from uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and that was Spinning Wheel. Great song, 1969. Okay, we got a lot of slides, 18 slides. I'm going to go as quick as I can through these. First section, workers and wage slaves. So early factory system was very difficult, and this actually continues through much of the 1800s, but long hours, low pay, unsafe working conditions, children worked in the factories like as young as six, seven years old, and that really continues into the early 1900s. However, conditions do improve slightly. There is movement for the 10-hour workday, higher wages, and better conditions, but that movement still doesn't happen too quickly, and also uh, more public education opportunities for children. Uh, workers later go on strike, especially in the late 1800s. We'll get, get to this when we get to that time period. Uh, that's probably the best method for uh, factory workers was the strike, to basically refuse to work and picket their owners. Could okay, highlight this, that most of the labor unions or trade unions, the unions are a big thing in A-Push. Uh, in the early 1800s, there weren't many of them, and those that were around, the unions were not successful. Uh, unions really do not get... Um, many victories until the 1930s, 100 years later. I would highlight this, though. One of the early uh, court cases, Supreme Court decisions, was called Commonwealth v. Hunt in 1842. And I would definitely highlight this is Massachusetts. This is a state Supreme Court decision that said labor unions were not illegal. So this is a victory for unions, but this happened only in Massachusetts. Uh, but it planned to seed for later success for unions to defend their workers. Okay, women in the economy, women, especially in the Northeast, worked in textile mills. Okay, the, this is the early factories for them. Unfortunately, they were hired for less money, and they were more agreeable to work with. That's partially why a lot of these factory owners wanted women. We're going to read about Lowell, Massachusetts, the mill girls. Uh, that was the model place for the rest of the industrial world. It showed that women could be very uh, useful in the factory and very good workers. Uh, and the Lowell factory system hired farm girls from the Massachusetts countryside to help them out with their textile factories. By 1850, 10% of white women worked for better pay outside the home, uh, 20% before marriage. Still, overall, most women stayed at home uh, in this antebellum America time period. Some other professions for women in the early 1800s were nursing, domestic service, and teaching. All right, continuing this section, you definitely need to highlight this. The cult of domesticity this is a must-know in A-Push. This is the belief in the early 1800s that women had a special role to play in their home as guardians of virtue and spiritual leaders for their children and in society. Any connections to previous history that we learned about this role of women, maybe from the early 1800s, even before that. So during this early um, 1800s time period, new methods were being used to raise children. They were supposed to be shaped, not broken. So disciplining your children hard was not as common, especially in the cities. The families became smaller, more affectionate, and child-centered during this um, early 1800s time period. Another term I would highlight is domestic feminism. It's probably not as important as the cult of domesticity, which actually was given more of a negative connotation for women. But domestic feminism said that women were getting more powerful, uh, despite not being able to vote, but they're getting more powerful and becoming more independent uh, while they were wrapped in the cult of domesticity because um, they had power at home. Women had power at home to shape uh, their children. Okay, Western farmers reaped the revolution in the fields, and so now we're going to talk about the agricultural revolution. Okay, this is very important. Uh, that it happens a little bit before the Industrial Revolution. We'll get to that in a second. All right, so flourishing farms were changing the face of the West. People were moving out west in droves in the 1800s, and they were farmers out west. Indiana, in Ohio and Illinois become the nation's breadbasket. They are also called the nation's butternut region. Butternut it has nothing to do with the bread. It has to deal with uh, their beliefs towards slaves in the South during the Civil War. We'll get to that later. So anyway, the farming revolution actually had better, um, or started earlier than the Industrial Revolution in the factories. So farming became pretty successful because of new inventions. And now farmers in the early 1800s were starting to produce cash crops. And they dominated the Midwest. And so these farmers bought more and more land and eventually all these machines to farm it. And these cash crops were basically they were going to raise crops and then sell them 
uh, for cash to be able to buy other things instead of growing your crops just to to live on. Two people I'd highlight, John Deere, you may have heard of him, think of the tractor. He, in 1837, invented the steel plow, which helped farming so much in the West. Another invention that really helped was Cyrus McCormick. Uh, in the 1830s, he developed the mechanical reaper mower. So the reaper is McCormick, and he basically uh, moved his operations later to Chicago, and he made um, cutting down wheat especially so much easier by these machines. Okay, here are some images. Uh, here's what the mechanical reaper looks like. Cyrus McCormick invented this. So especially wheat, it made chopping wheat so much easier and more profitable for farmers. And the telegraph was also another invention. This obviously was not agricultural. It was more for communication. But that was Samuel Morse. And get used to this image of beards. I love beards. A lot of famous beards in history. And Samuel Morse is, is our first introduction to that. And boy, I cannot wait to see a Walt Whitman's beard. My goodness. That or John Brown are the two most famous beards that I've seen. But who could forget about Charles Beard as well, the famous uh, interpreter of the Constitution in the early 1900s. Historiography. All right, I'm on pace for 24 minutes. That's way too long, so let's move on. Early inventions, I want you to know these five. The Reaper, Sewing Machine, Cotton Gin, Telegraph, Steel Plow, and I want you to know this. I want you to know who invented each of these five major early inventions and when they did this. Okay, I think it's very important that you know this. Also, how they impacted uh, the country. This is for textiles, cotton uh, manufacturing improved greatly. This is for farming out west, especially wheat. This also is for farming out west as well, making making it easier to uh, plow up the, the tough soil. Uh, the telegraph improved communication. The sewing machine also improved textiles, which made factories places where spinning wheels became popular. I get it. The spinning wheel, what goes up must come down. Okay, these are two documents in your book. Let's look at the first one over here, 1790s, probably around the Revolution time period. You have a wheel maker and also his apprentice, his two apprentices that are working underneath him. And then fast forward later in history during the Industrial Revolution, probably around the 1830s, 1840s, you have these giant factories where a bunch of wheels were made in mass production. Change over time. Okay, next, the transportation revolution. And these three revolutions go hand in hand. The Industrial Revolution... The agricultural revolution, transportation revolution, all these things happened about the same time, and they made our country special, made our economy grow. So transportation was needed for our raw materials to be brought back to the factories in the east, and also so the finished products to be delivered to the markets back west and to the south. So we need better transportation, and so some of the early transportations began with highways, and so these were called turnpikes. A turnpike is, is a type of highway. The first ever one is the Lancaster Turnpike in 1790s in Pennsylvania. Uh, maybe not extremely important, but it was the first, uh, and basically it brought a hard surface highway for, for the public to use. However, people had to pay a toll, a toll, a toll fee, um, in order to use the road, and this is how they're able to fix and improve the roads. The most famous road, we've heard this before, is the National Road, also called the Cumberland Road. You need to know this, highlight this, and this was built over a 40-year period, um, and this is, the this is the beginning of the Turnpike era, where roads became very important, especially around the 1790s or early 18-teens, where highways was, was a way to, to uh, improve transportation. And I would highlight this, most of these early roads were made by the state governments, this is probably the only one or the only one you need to know that was made by the national government, the federal government. But otherwise, most of these roads were created by state governments. And so this was built, the national road was built by the federal government, began in 1811 and lasted 40 years and it lasted um, such a long time to finally get built. Partially why it took it so long is because of the state's rights people. They were against federal internal improvements, so there was definitely a lot of backlash to building this road. But eventually it is built. It starts here in Maryland, the major city to the east, my geography people, Maryland, looking at Baltimore and also eventually Washington, D.C. To the west, what's to the west of Vandalia, uh, Illinois? We've got St. Louis right here. So this road did make transportation better um, by road. We do know that the Ohio River was probably the main source of transportation heading west. Continuing, so we talk about the National Road, went from Cumberland, Maryland to Illinois, basically Baltimore to St. Louis, and it was a very long road, took 40 years, and it was done by the federal government. Now, highlight this, the Sustainable Era begins about this time, maybe a little bit later in the early 1800s, and Robert Fulton, I would know this name, he is basically the first steamboat he builds in 1807, Robert Fulton, look at this beautiful piece of machinery, we can go upstream now instead of downstream only, so it just made transportation so much better, 
so the rivers became two-way arteries, especially the Mississippi River. This, one, this river went north and south, and it made it so much easier to transport um, goods north up the river. And this actually helps New Orleans become a very popular city and one of the leaders in terms of transportation and also trade. So look at this example. There were 60 uh, steamboats by 1820. Over 1,000 were on the river by 1860, showing the importance of the steamboat. Doot, doot. That might have been a train sound. I'm not sure. Yeah, Clinton's big ditch in New York. My goodness. We talked about Hillary. No, we're not talking about Hillary. We're talking about the Erie Canal in New York. And the canal era begins in the 1810s and 1820s. And I would highlight the Erie Canal. This is a must-know and a push. You must read about this. Look at the map. And basically, this canal connected Albany, New York, west to Buffalo, New York. And we'll look at a map a little bit later. Uh, and it connects the East Coast with the Great Lakes. And this is so important. There's so many things we need to know about it. Number one, this canal was built entirely by the state of New York. The governor of New York's last name was Clinton. That's why call it, they call it his big ditch. 363 miles. So it was very impressive that the state of New York built it by themselves without any federal government. So we talk about Clinton's big ditch, also the governor's gutter. So it was criticized a little bit, but it was so important for the state of New York and especially New York City. So it greatly cut the cost of shipping from $100 down to $5. So it improved transportation and shipping goods so much better. The time to ship goods went from 20 days to 6 days, so it drastically cut that. And the value of the land along the canal goes up dramatically, similar to M6. Let's think about M6. We, got, we are pretty blessed in Hudsonville because of M6, because what it's done to our population. And so you need to know this as well. The canals run east and west. Most of the canals that were built in America during this time period were east and west, uh, and most of them were built in, in the north. Oh, no, I have to talk about the railroad. I'm going to really work on my pronunciation this year. So Pioneer Railroad Promoters. So the first railroad in the United States was 1820. I want you to know this. 1820 was the first railroad, and it was several years after the first canals and the first uh, roads were built. And by 1860, we had over 30,000 miles of railroad and you cannot underestimate the importance of the railroad. It's very important. We're going to talk about this for the next several chapters, how it changed America. All right, but the boom in the railroads came from 1850 to 1860. And we'll talk. We'll look at a map here a little bit later. But most railroads were built in the north. I would highlight this as well. And this helps the north win the Civil War against the south. Okay, the first railroads were very dangerous. There was many accidents and viewed by the public as a public menace. And so people were not too did not think too fondly of the early railroads because of the danger. However, improvements did occur. There were brakes added finally. Um, the distance of the track became standardized, and, um, and so it was a little bit easier to transport people on the railroads, especially into the 1850s. And thankfully, by 1859, the Pullman Palace car was created, which made travel by railroad a lot more comfortable. And oh my goodness, George Pullman, I cannot wait to talk about him. Unfortunately, he did die. A lot of most people in history do die, but his death is remarkable. And I got a story for you. I cannot wait until um, I'm looking at February, March, George Pullman, fire up. You need to know the transportation revolution was so huge. This happened the same time as the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, and it connected our nation during this time period. 1807 to 1860. We say 1807 because that's when the steamboat was created. So you need to know the big four methods of transportation. The steamboat, roads, canals, and railroads. Okay, This changed our country forever and made us a market economy. I'll get to that in the last slide. So the steamboat allowed for reverse transportation upriver, especially the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Canals and roads, they help with east-west east -west flow of traffic. I would highlight that. Um, so it made getting out west a lot easier. And the railroads were mostly located in the north. The south had very few railroads uh, for transportation. All right, so again, I think you need to know this. So I think you need to know the progression of transportation. It begins mostly with roads and turnpikes, and they weren't very good. Most of them were funded by the state. Steamboats event in 1807, which is huge. The Erie Canal is created during the, ooh, what I've seen this time period, the era of good feelings, uh, which made New York City just the major city in America and the railroad is developed in 1828, and it really sees improvements by the 1850s, which helps our, the North, especially during the Civil War in the 1860s. Finishing up this section, because of the improved transportation, each region specialized in its economic activity. We know that the South produced cotton. That went to the Northeast for the factories. Western grain and livestock went to the Northeast in Europe. The Northeast machines and textiles went to the South and West. And the South thought the Mississippi River 
would link them to other states in the world, thus they did not support internal improvements very much. The South um, overestimated the Mississippi River's importance, and it was important, but especially after the Erie Canal was built, New York City becomes the most important city in America, not New Orleans. And so on the next slide, I'm going to go into detail what every region traded um, with each other. Let's start in the South. So cotton is king cotton in the South. We'll really get to this in a later chapter, talking about the importance of cotton. But basically, cotton was transferred to the North. Okay, And why did it not really go to the West? Well, the North had the factories, the textile factories, the textile mills. For example, Lowell, Massachusetts, where the cotton was changed into clothing or textiles for people to wear. So cotton went to the North. What came down from the north to the south was manufactured products, especially the textiles, shoes, and so on, because this is where the factories were. Out west, they were grains and livestock. They, they sent their grains and livestock to the northeast to feed them, but also to Europe as well. So trade becomes important to them to get it out and trade their food and livestock to Europe. And then finally, we talk about the factories were in New England, and they sent um, out to the west their manufactured goods. So manufacturing becomes so important in New England because that's their lifeblood. That's why New England won the higher tariff, because Europe was also trying to sell their manufactured goods and compete with America. So the tariff was so important to New England. I just want to highlight this term, the market economy. This, is, this time period is the market economy in America where we are, we, where it really develops. That's what we have today, but it really develops in antebellum America where trade becomes so important be, be, between each of the regions and trade becomes so much easier because of the transportation revolution. Okay, two more sections. Wealth and poverty. The increased prosperity for most Americans did happen during the Industrial Revolution, so that, that's a good thing. We did improve overall, but the gap was definitely widened between the rich and poor, and oh my goodness, this gap is going to get so much bigger. In the late 1800s, we talk about the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, but this gap does start to widen because uh, not everybody is a farmer now. We're having become we're seeing more wealthy people become business owners, factory owners, and they're getting very wealthy off wage workers. Okay, the American life provided many opportunities than in Europe. I should say more opportunities. So again, America overall is always more more opportunities for people than Europe. There was some rag to riches stories, especially Andrew Carnegie will talk about him in a couple months. But overall, though, the rags to riches story, the successful stories were relatively few, especially early on. Um, before the Civil War. There was some social mobility where people could move up to social classes, uh, but it was not as common as most people believed. And especially in the South, social mobility going from the poor to the wealthy rarely happened. The last slide, the first ever telegraph line was connecting America to Europe, was actually laid in the Atlantic Ocean in 1850. That's a little bit of interesting uh, trivia, not too important. Um, 1840s, 1850s, American-made clipper ships dominated the seas, so we had a good 10, 20-year period. We had sleek, fast ships that were very good for transportation and for our merchants. However, eventually, though, the steam engine's going to change this and make these ships obsolete, so they weren't very important. And the iron steamers uh, did crush the clipper ships later in history, so we had a, we had a good run, but it did end. Okay, here's how dedicated Mr. Beamer is. It is 7.53 p.m., Okay, and he's still here. He's even using my pen. Where's the camera? It's right there. There it is. My yeah, pen. Michelle Jasky, fire up. I love you. Isn't You're that awesome. Wonderful, because we share. And we we love share each other about relationships. Hallway. Peace, and we love. love. We love Mr. Venor too. We love because him too. He busts it as well. Fire so up. Keep it up. Go get him. All right, I wanted to thank Miss, uh, Mrs. Jasky for that. That was exciting. I don't know why I still have this little thing here. That's kind of exciting. Oh, it went away. Okay, so quickly, what I got to do? So I did a Pony Express. Okay, it was mail delivering out throughout the West. People were excited. Missouri to California lasted a very long time, only 18 months. That's it. Well, it could not compete with the telegraph line. Machine is greater than man. Fire up. Good night.